Thank you very much. My name is Michael Melanie. I'm directing this toward um, Mr. Wagner. And Mr. Wagner, did you um, realize that um, there's actually these large development projects, a few of them have actually integrated bringing nature and the environment actually within their projects, like on top of Brickell City Center, Miami World Center, you've heard of those, those projects. They're actually building rooftop parks and gardens with real environments right on their roof to have um, public displays. And also with um, under our Metro Rail system, you're familiar with that system, they are going to build um, a park with um, real native trees and um, other features that um, are actually going to um, benefit um, the environment as well as um, sustainability and still um, allow development to happen. Have you um, heard of those me methods? And um, if so, what have you? Um, what is your take on this? And um, how would you want to work with those methods? Um, well, I think regarding bringing native planting and education is always, I think, a vital part to the solution, right? The community needs to know and needs to be aware of the problems and the potential solutions. I think uh, my project is a bit different than sort of those, those are more inland. I'm more focused on the coastal side. I think uh, the underlying project is great to really, because it's going to be a vocal, vocal for the urban design and the community lands and the educational landscape. Um, but I, I do think there's a there's a need for an overarching uh, sort of a city lens as well. And uh, I mean, it's a challenging question to really create a solution for the entire Miami region. But I think these projects start to make people aware. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Esteban Biondi. I'm an engineer. I've been working consulting engineer for many years, uh, working a lot with architects and land planners. Um, I first want to make a general comment, and I think most, if not all, of your comments were about retrofitting existing developed areas, and, and I really like the, the last uh, historical references of South Florida, because today, I see many of my clients in the Caribbean and Latin America that want to do the exact same type of destruction that had happened already in, in Florida. So on one hand, it's really important to go through the process to try to retrofit what's already uh, done incorrectly here 100 years ago or 50 years ago because there wasn't that much this, that type of level of destruction done in the last 10 or 15 years. And I want to go back to that. Um, but the fact that there's still destruction going on in other places, it's alarming. And I, from my little niche in consulting engineer, I try to do my best to uh, educate my clients. And I don't like the word, but uh, maybe it, we use it uh, in this context. Um, but it's hard. It's very, very hard. So I just, this is just a, my comment as a practicing professional to the students here that there's still a lot of work to, to be done. Um, and then for your three, I, I love the, the roots in the, in the drawings. Um, but as an engineer, I know that the dune restoration is needed to protect the houses next year. So there is, there is a balance that needs to be done. So I would like your comment about that. I understand the long-term planning, but those were done because of immediate need of protection. Um, to to uh, Greg, whom I've already met. Um, I think that Florida has great examples to show that stormwater management was done right uh, when it was in the last 15 years. So uh, I know that there is a, that level of restoration needs to be done, uh, but it's really proven uh, that a lot better work is already being done in Florida. I'm actually trying to export the Florida experience to Latin America and the Caribbean in that respect, where civil engineers do not understand the concept of water quality associated to stormwater management. They only try to get the water out of the property as quickly as possible, the same as in the US 50 years ago. Um, and regarding the last uh, presentation, uh, my question is, have you run this concept through any kind of reality check from a permitting standpoint? Because the converting seagrasses into mangroves is something that I really makes a lot, of, a lot of sense, but I don't think the regulatory agencies are still up to speed today. 
Sorry for the time, but. I... Well, I should use this. Um, I, I could comment on, on all three of, somehow, all three of those comments and, and the more general, uh, and, and there's, you say so much at, at once, I must say, so let, let me try to break it down. Um, within the construction detail itself that I'm presenting, we're working with the Army Corps of Engineers. So what you inherit as a construction detail, especially, actually globally, but let's say especially federally, uh, is, is developed by the, that agency. So it is best practices now, but it is from the 30s. And there's no question that everything is changing and <coughs> details can change too. So what, what is missing right now is the data of, of below grade. Right now, all below grade testing is used, pol they use poles in all models, digital and analog. And you know, I'm arguing and also bringing toward uh, that conversation a, a deeper understanding of what's concealed can also have value. I think that is also implicit in what my colleagues here have presented. That sometimes it's not that obvious, you know, to the visual, to the to the naked eye, what's actually happening in an environment, and we have to we have to take stock of that. So, you know. Uh, this is unfortunate that everything of value is visible, and I'm sure you know that as an engineer, right? But you know, we we have to start to to push up against uh, all of the values that we that we currently have. And frankly, I would say the regulatory environment that I've exp that I've interacted with in in Miami is m much more ahead of the curve than the designers that I've met in Miami. Um, <laughs> Miami Beach, uh, City of Miami Beach, who I've been working with for a year and a half are very aware, both of Isaac's pro project, obviously, of Greg's work, and also of uh, not what's going on right now, but the, the 10 to 25 years ahead because of, because of the value of the land, but, but in terms of how those details have to change, because the details they have are just getting bigger and badder. And that, that's not enough, as you know. So um, the regulatory environment is ready for it. You, you're in a, a government where you know, the, 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 the politics play a role and the conversation between Miami and, and Miami Beach play a role and then more, more broadly with Miami-Dade and then even more broadly with the, the, the state government. So um, the regulatory environment in Miami and Miami Beach that I've encountered is very open-minded and is already studying and collaborating, for instance, with us with, at, at Harvard to develop the next generation. So maybe you'll be exporting those in, in no time, those details. But in terms of water, which I won't take up any more time, but in terms of water is actually much less developed than in the infrastructural uh, concepts. You know, Miami and Miami Beach still, you know, they, there's tons of salt water and there's not enough fresh water and yet there's still a combined sewer system. So it rains. You know, out, we have going on six years of drought out west. If this was a University of California, we'd be talking about drought. That is the environmental risk. We don't, they do not have enough water coming down from the sky. They can't make that happen. You have more, you, you have a wonderful freshwater resource because you're in a subhumid tropic, a tropical climate. And it's not being captured. It, it, Point final, sorry. We have to work on water capture because it's not just about too much water, it's actually just too much salt water. So, you know, you, you, when the sewers overflow, they're overflowing with fresh and salt water that have been combined in, in Miami Beach. And that's hugely problematic if you could hold on to the, to the fresh water, which will become a crisis in its own time. Um, so, I mean, I think projects like Isaac's and, and like Greg's are really, are really important and then you have to take into account the temporal scale, like what's happening now is what Greg can do. What's happening in the next 10 years is absolutely what Isaac presented. This, sh this should be a consideration, but it doesn't really go beyond that because things start to get a little messy, it, you know, unless behavioral changes unfold at the same time as infrastructural regulatory changes. I would say I'm very well aware of the regula regulation that I do not meet in the project that I present. I do work <laughs> in Miami Beach quite frequently. Um, but it's not about getting the project built. It's about getting people educated and thinking about it. It's, you know, I, I did this in university. I made it look somewhat feasible just so people could think it, it could happen. But not, there's no reality, you know. We have to change. You have to convince Tallahassee, right? Miami Beach is on board. Tallahassee is not on board, okay? So we have to. 
It's sort of educating beyond just this and getting Miami Beach to help us, getting Miami Dade to be on board. The education starts to happen, and then these details can change from 90 years ago. Um, I think that that was an interesting question, very long question, <laughs> a very interesting question. Uh, I think uh, they touched upon a few of the points that I wanted to make, um, but the, the thing I would add regarding to your very, very first point about destruction continuing to happen elsewhere, I think it's a very important one. And, <clears throat> and I think the, our approach is this, this part of this destruction happens because you put a particular economic driver ahead of other type of economic drivers. Uh, and so you make your decision that way. Um, and what we're trying to say is that whatever drove you to that destruction um, of, the, of the natural system uh, in order for you to get whatever you wanted to get back can still happen in a way where you can still maintain a fair amount of natural systems. Uh, and that <clears throat> goes to this idea of, you know, the low impact development that, you know, has been going on for, for a long time, but also this idea of maintaining the suite of ecosystem services that will help you thrive in the long term. And I think that's what I was really trying to say with this sort of new model of development where yes, you still need to, to do some amount of destruction in order to do this or to do that, but there might be ways where you can actually minimize the destruction to still get a little bit of what you wanted out of it. I think it's, it's, it gets very complicated very fast, especially when you have a you know, very strong driver of the movement. Um, but often, from my understanding, these, these drivers, these main drivers of destruction are really after one type of goal and forget all the other constituents in the society. And so really sort of our taking an ecosystem service point of view, taking uh, uh, ecosystem sort of the value of, a, of, a, of the ecosystem services sort of point of view, help you come up with other type of economic argument that can balance whatever uh, that main sort of economic driver for destruction is. Can I, um, can I interject? Yeah, go for it. Well, it's fun, you know, when you have a panel that it isn't just us answering questions, but that there's also a dialogue sometimes, right? <laughs> so that's why I'm interjecting, no, sorry. No, go for it. Um, because I, I don't believe in ecosystem services, mm -hmm. personally. I think that we're having a really hard time gaining traction with ecosystem services in argumentation with the regulatory environment, with the federal go government, because it is so difficult to quantify these things. So we cannot add economic value to some of the things that are beyond economics. And I, I personally, as a Canadian who worked uh, in Holland for my professional career, I think climate and politics are far too associated in America, and this is stems from economics. And so as soon as we bring the argument right back to economics, I think we're basically just playing out the same game again. And I, I, I believe that that's problematic, but I, I mean, I'm eternal op eternally optimistic. I think that, that climate change is a game changer and we should change with it and not just try to adapt it to the last 100 years of development. Miami Beach was dredged and filled and, and had a beach created on a mangrove swamp for economic reasons. You could have made an ecosystem services argument for planting avocados and coconuts instead of mangroves at the time, and you would have still came up with the same spatial consequence. And so making it only about economics is at times, I think, reductive, especially when, you know, look, we're not sitting at a table where we're building it tomorrow. We're sitting here with a generation that's going to go in, as far as I'm concerned, and uh, make those arguments palatable. So uh, my... <coughs> The reaction to that is that um, if you take the uh, example of the you know, destruction of the mangrove to replace it with a, uh, excuse me, <coughs> the, the example of the mangrove to, to replace it with um, uh, um, whatever avocado farm or whatever you want it, I would not consider that like this new field 
like I, I wouldn't consider, I would not say that you still maintain an a flow of ecosystem services. You still go to a unifunction sort of structure. The same way that your seawall is a unifunction sort of, you know, structure, the same way that saying you use a mangrove forest to protect your, your coast is, is basically taking the ecosystem and looking at it for one function. So it's, it's still the same, so this idea of structure that comes back to engineering, or also economics, et cetera, et cetera. The definition of green infrastructure that I presented, I highlighted the ecosystem function, values and function, functioning and uh, ecosystem in order to supply a series of ecosystem services. So it's not looking at, I have a problem, I'm gonna use a mangrove forest to solve that problem instead of a seawall, because you don't change anything. Mm -hmm. you're, still, you're still looking at a tool. And I guess what I'm talking about is a series, a flow of ecosystem mm -hmm. services. So if you have a person who says, I need to transform this forest into a plantation of mangroves or whatever, this person is basically saying, I'm gonna destroy this ecosystem or palm oil, which actually, actually is happening. I'm gonna destroy this whole ecosystem to basically use one ecosystem services, which is, let's say, food. That's not a flow of ecosystem services. That's, that's basically a manufacturing enterprise. So how do and you so what I'm saying is, what really drove those people from making this um, sort of decision is the economic importance of, and so what you lose are all the economic, uh, because ultimately we are driven by economic forces. Well, and we can, I mean, yeah, ultimately. We're also, we're also being driven by climate forces. Now. We're also driven by yeah. climate forces, but so, I say as a society, we are driven by economic forces. And so we also need to take into account all the other economic aspects around us. And um, what I'm trying to say very quickly, my mind is a bit foggy because I have a cold, but what I'm trying to say is that ultimately we need to make an argument for the flow of it, for all the ecosystem services that we have in a particular environment. Look at the sort of uh, proposition that is put forward right. for the destruction so, of this, quantify what we lose. So we're saying the same thing. I, yes. I mean, no more you know, individual static re yeah. reactions to systems. Like and that's don't, don't, don't impose individual metrics on systematic issues, right. systemic. Yes. Uh, I should say that more articulate. I should, no, no more individual solutions to systemic problems. Replacing, that, replacing uh, an so, engineering solution. No question. Yes. No question. But as soon as you try to quantify a system, unfortunately, they 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 get they get but put into an Excel spreadsheet with boxes ready. around them, and that's that's all that I'm talking about. On a speculative, because we're saying the same thing. Yeah. I'm saying as soon as you arrest them and you stop them and you quantify them you also lose the systemic quality that you were after in the first place. So there is also, it's very tough to, to push up against these, these boxes that we need to, to survive as humans, but there's also plenty of, of stuff that doesn't fit into boxes so nicely yeah. that you as designers know well about. And I guess, I, just very quickly, but I guess that goes back to the second point, which is in a way you could say maybe perhaps at a large scale, stormwater management maybe works at a large scale in, 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 in Florida. At a small scale, some of my observations show that it's not working. But so you could say at a large scale, and I, maybe I misunderstood what you were, what you were saying, um, but you could say at a large scale, okay, we can live with a little bit of flooding here and there, we can live with a little bit of flooding here and there. Uh, stormwater management may be perhaps uh, a good at a large scale. But what I'm trying to do is by reintroducing some of the sort of low impact development sort of solutions for stormwater management, is not only using the ecosystem service that they provide, but also sort of change the dialogue about the role of nature in our lives, which is maybe what does not fit into that box. Mm -hmm. Is this sort of, with all this discussion about value, this value that is fundamentally, we need nature to survive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I guess my question to you is that is, you, you speak of climate change as the force for changing the sort of the epidemic or the how we approach uh, nature solutions and the flowing resources. But how would we, I guess, those would still be valued by economic sort of just spreadsheets to make these decisions. So I mean, how do you, how are they unmarried, I guess is my question. Well, I, I mean, I, I, 
if I take an example that I'm more familiar with, but we put it in South Miami, let's say. I mean, when a devastation would, okay, if a hurricane or, or too much daily flooding or nuisance flooding, as you call it, or whatnot, comes over one side or it hits as a hurricane on the other, you know, you're, you're on this micro level, you're constantly rebuilding. That, that's a system, right? And if it happens at a certain scale where it becomes economically unfeasible, right? That's the spreadsheet. Then you replace it with something that does become economically feasible. But you're not scaling out enough to understand uh, on the long term the actual effects of that economic instability, which could become more economically feasible if it was transformed. So it, it's, the, it's that, that notion of transformation that we're not comfortable with. Again, if I take an example I'm more familiar with, we build, we, we dredge and build in salt marshes in the Northeast all the time. So what if we just stopped that habit? Economically, we would have you know, less homes by the sea, which are the most expensive properties. So economically, we lose out. What do we, what do we gain? A critical setback, which means a gain of life. I mean, we won't have people dying in hurricanes if, they don't, if there is a critical setback. What do we gain? Maybe we gain more public space that doesn't look so much like a dredged beach, but looks like a coastal forest. Something is lost, something is gained. So in every economic model, there's a trade-off. I don't think we're putting enough trade-offs in the models that we're looking at when we look at current economic development, like the one in my, like if you yeah. replace a road with a, a canal in your, in your scheme, which we should talk about, because I don't understand why they're not going east-west. I think that would be so interesting. But um, uh, you're replacing a road with a canal. There's a trade-off. So they're both economic models, but one may, you know, maybe on paper, the road makes much more sense, but in that not wishy-washy boxes bit, the, the canal makes more sense. So at what point do you decide on the climate or do you decide on the economics? And if it is just a number game, the economics will win every time because we're not looking out far enough. But it's still, I mean, That's, if you zoom out enough, right? Yeah. It's still a con I feel like it's still a con that's still valuing the health and safety, like we're creating life, we're, we're still creating. No, we're, we're creating, creating, we're creating a certain kind of habitation that we, that, that, protect that, that, with what? When we're rebuilding? Yeah, if we, if we, if we create the setback, we're, aren't we saving in the long term, I guess is my. Yes, if we, if we so create we still, the setback, so yeah. If we create, it's still, and I guess my perspective, my lens is that, that's still, I guess, marketed or sold as like an economic solution to. Not if you put those boxes on the salt marsh. You're putting it now on the high ground, That's what let's I'm saying. say. But if you're putting it so, on the high ground, it's still, you're selling it still as economic solution. To well, it. I wouldn't, but yeah. I, I'm making the analogy for you. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I was very curious for a question to out here. Um, how, I mean, the history, the, 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 you know, quick and dirty, cohesive history that, that Isaac presented, most of you know that, or was that a surprise to you? I just don't know sort of who's out there. I mean. Do, do you know about the canalization and, and the dredging of Miami Beach and the, the sand is, I mean, Miami Beach is an invention, right? We all know that, right? Okay, so, or, sorry, just for me, I wanted to know because I also spoke with the head of restoration at the Army Corps for the Everglades and he said, oh yeah, don't, you know, we're restoring our canals. <laughs> That's what we're restoring. I mean, we put, we put Lake Okeechobee in a, a concrete bowl and we tipped it. There's no going, there's no restoring that. So, you know, every time you do a restoration project, that's why it's also temporal and also scalar and it has to be considered and it's tough to consider all those things at the same time. But, you, you know, you are, you are doing micro restorations to what is ostensibly a visual cue of what you want the Everglades to look like, not the function. Sorry, that, that, it doesn't make me a pessimist. It just means let's accept it, but then let's move forward from that. And, and anything else is a, just nostalgia. I think there was another question. We have one more question. Hi. Um, sorry. There's another, there's maybe two. No, maybe two. Um, I was, there's somebody very eager right Okay, great. Okay. So I was just uh, going to ask something a little more towards design than economy and development. but. Um, I was thinking that we're, we're saying that we're trying to delay the time, we're trying to explore through uh, adaptation, um, extending this time, no? So now that we say, for example, an area is like a, a hundred years flooding or a 500 years flooding, like in this case, like we're changing a hundred years to, 
to 500 years, but how does that changes or ways of, of adapting, like a human way of adapting into these schemes of, of, of um, different na nature around you or different, because you know also there's these other social, social problems which, which, are, which are had like great, um, uh, like terrible consequences to our environment, which are for example the contaminated rivers in the Mississippi rivers, and these are also affecting like our seawater or and and the nature in the seawater like you can't grow anything else when you have the algae they are already you know uh you can't grow these marshes again and back again so how is that adapting right and also for example like we are not changing that housing um, development on the coast because we want to live in the coast we want to you know this this is there's this new approach towards living on near the water but so the question is uh, how, like, how to acquire, how to change uh, the design built of our societies to adapt to this longer period of, of water, like living with the water, right? So because we're, we're looking at some of the options of like adapting the, adapting the water in, in design, right? So, so but not ourselves. Do you know, how, you know how old Miami Beach is? Like it's a hundred old. years old, <laughs> right? Okay? Because the images right. are, it's a hundred years old. Uh, so, so it was, it's very difficult for, for humans to see increments and to see the result of, uh, of, of their behavior. But let's say that over the last hundred years, that which was driving us was growth, right? Economics and growth. And so when those first fields were dredged, I don't think Collins could have imagined what Miami Beach is now, right? He couldn't have. But we transform, we as humans transformed a mangrove swamp into that incredible economic center that Isaac described, and an incredible social and cultural valuable object. It's a concretized object now, Miami Beach. It's this, in, it's this cultural gem. We could never have imagined that transformation, never. But it happened. So we have, I mean, and, and other transformations, we can go 100 years behind you know, that in, 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 other, in other parts of the world. But incrementally, we have now human history. So we know that it happens, and we know that it's possible. That's why I'm saying, if we know it's going to happen, and it's changing more rapidly, we have to be able to start to project that isn't just another growth mechanism off of those you know, decades that are piling up, but something completely else. What do we want Miami Beach to look like in the next 100 years? It won't stay the same. It won't stay the same, as it hasn't in the last 100. Um, That's a challenge as a designer. So, I so there's, I think, three, three points uh, come to my mind. The first one is that, um, and it's more of a question than anything else, and maybe I'm not the right person from TNC to ask it, but. You know, is it, is it, I start to wonder exactly what, you know, we talk about polluted rivers and, and degraded, degraded environment, the example of the Everglades. I mean, at some point we have to accept, to accept that that's the world we live in um, and, and, and figure out what to move forward from that rather than trying to, to sort of restore, restore, restore. Uh, I don't know how many billions have been pumped into the Everglades. The second, um, the second point um, is this idea of 100-year flood or this idea of design criteria. I, I was trying to find what is the 25-year return period of a storm surge for Miami. I had five different answers from government agencies. There is no one number. And so it's basically all this sort of criteria that we come up with are basically ways to sort of do something about something to maintain what we have because we think it's important to maintain it. Going back to this discussion we had about, you know, ecosystem services, one economic model for development. And then the third point is some from an island from the Caribbean called Martinique in, uh, from basically 1800 to 1932 or so, 1912, sorry, I should know my history better, it's my island. Uh, the main capital of Martinique was St. Pierre big economic developers, uh, development, the big you know, engine of the lower Antilles, all the big vessels from France would go there and then the cargo would be split into the other islands. Now it's 
Fort de France, which is another town. And what it tells me, and what uh, I'm saying that, going back to this, this all, this all temporary, all these sort of values of place and, and, and wanting to keep and wanting to that, it's, it's all temporary. It's all based on the decision of what we are, what we have now. And a catastrophe happens, and we move on to something else. And I, I, I don't want to um, decrease the importance of Miami Beach as an economic driver for Florida, but I know that our economic drivers and center for economic growth move the same way that plants move. And so um, I don't want to sort of go continue on this line of thought. I don't want to, I want to stop here, but um, we sort of, we put a static map in our, in our head of what is valuable and where it is, and there are consequences to that. And I think part of maybe what we talked about today is maybe changing some of that. So join me in thanking our three speakers.